and welcome to episode 79 of Lesbian Talk. And um, we've been away for a while, and uh, I blame the everything exploded. And coyotes happened. There were no coyotes whatsoever. I don't know. There's no, there's no like, southwestern stuff here. There's no snakes, there's no cactuses, there are no coyotes. There's southwestern no. sauce and dairy. South- a- <sighs> southwestern sauce is a big, fat lie. It's Thousand Island. It's Thousand Island dressing. She came back from the... Okay, here's the background. She came back from the chippy with, with, with lunch for, for us. And she's like, look, they gave me this new sauce to try. It's called Southwestern Sauce. And I tasted it. It's Thousand Island dressing, y'all. That's very new and interesting for Northern Ireland. They have this abomination called taco sauce, but they pronounce it taco sauce, and it's really great on me. But it's like this unholy matrimony of mayonnaise and ketchup and God only knows what else, and it's disgusting. <laughs> But we have a guest with us, taco sauce aside. Yes. <laughs> Creeper Wolf, introduce yourself. Be nice, or else I'll go Ivan Milan your asses. <laughs> yeah, how you two doing? We're doing fine. Omega has been uh, killing things in the Age of Dragons, and I have been <laughs> cutting things in the Age of Footage to Cut Up. Pretty much. So, cutting on both sides then, that's good. Yeah, but not in, like, you know, the bad way. Like the, the, the heroic and also blip way. I don't know. The movie I'm I'm sort of cutting voiceover for, there's some cue jumping in it, you know, cutting in line, and uh, the greatest extra in the film is annoyed at this. You'll understand it when you see my Christmas special. And oh, yeah, that was, yeah. Because I've seen the movie that she's doing, and let me just tell you what. I mean, I'm telling you what. And given how long it's going to take us to get this on TigWitig because of the massive clusterfuck of getting people on, on TigWitig, uh... It might be a while, maybe. Well, people will listen for my lips, so, you know, they're, they know what's up. They know the thing. That's good. But yes, uh, Wolf Creep is here as... <laughs> Creeper Wolf. Creeper Wolf sounds cooler. <laughs> I, uh, I I think for the sake of coherency, we should probably just drop that. It's Mahan, just for the record, <laughs> just so when people try and look up stuff about me later, they don't go, oh, wait, who the hell is this Wolf <laughs> Creeper, creeper, wolf guy. It was I, you, the, Mahan, the whole time. I just, just, like I just the master. wanted to reference Wolf Creek. Oh. Yeah, I, I appreciate it, but just, you know, I confuse people enough already. We don't need your help. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, honey, you, like, you are kind of like, you know how when you're trying to do something complicated and the cat's like, I'll help. That's kind of what it's like. <laughs> you, give, you bring the help of cats. But Mahan is... Uh, is a supporter on Patreon and uh, had the choice between either getting a cameo or appearing on Lesbian Talk. And I'm really, really delighted that you chose this one because it's less work for me. Lesbian Talk! <laughs> Yay! Yes, uh, yeah. I, w- I, w- I went with this on the um, request of a good mate of mine, Lucas, and good God am I glad that I followed his suggestion because I'm pretty sure I'd l- I'm liking this a hell of a lot better. To be honest. Yeah, filming is really hard. I moved over here and found that out. Yeah, you're all like, it'll be easy and fun. It'll just be like rainbows and fluffy things. And suddenly it's over. It's like every two weeks. It takes hours. Oh, no. Ah. It does. I'm kind of like I'll have to cram in my brother-in-law's bedroom and set everything up. And then it's done. I'm like, oh, I want takeaway. That was long. Also hard. And And I'm the one who has to do most of the work. Oh, yeah, that's true. (laughs) <laughs> we just, we just, we just kind of have to be there. Oh no, there was that time we had to film the thing, and I I wore shoulder armor, which looked really awesome, but in retrospect was a really bad idea. Oh, really the intro back, the intro to bitch slot, which yeah. took about took a long time. Yeah, it took like all day, didn't it? Not quite all day, but it was a decent amount of time. It was it was more complicated and longer than filming like an episode of Hagen just for the intro at the start and the intro I cut a page out while we were filming and then the, another page was cut out in editing so yeah and then I busted out my vocal cords for you because you were like scream no scream louder I can't scream anymore <sighs> <laughs> but uh, today's lesbian talk is going to concentrate on fantasy movies the first half of the show is going to talk about uh, older fantasy movies and the second half is going to talk about ones uh, since Lord of the Rings it's not limited uh, just to American ones. We're going to go very international, any ones that you can think of. So, Mahan, best fantasy movie, go! Uh, really, the main fantasy movie that I watched a lot of as a kid, and I can't believe I'm even about to say this, uh, Kazam. With Shaq? With Shaq, yeah. I that remember was like that one of the, came out. That was one of like the five 
uh, videos that I had growing up that I watched on on a loop, pretty much. I, I don't know what to be more baffled about. The fact that just fantasy has now grown to include that abomination, <laughs> well, or the fact that you're speaking of it with some degree of fondness. Well, honey, technically it, it involves a supernatural being, like I'm, I'm a mythological being. Horrified. A genie, no, because a genie is a mythological creature. Fair enough. I thought maybe I could go the easy route and maybe go with, hmm, Nightmare on Elm Street or something like that, but I'm like, nah, That's I want to bring horror out the movie. real stuff. That's, it's still we, fantasy, though. We, we obviously didn't work out the parameters properly before the episode began. <laughs> see, it's nice to see the tables <laughs> turned on you, because you're always doing shit like this and being like, oh, things and stuff, and I'm like, well, and you're like, no, because, and I'm like, but we have to examine the parameters. You're like, no, but I win because things and stuff. So it's it's good to see the tables turned on you. <laughs> My brilliant revenge has come to fruition, even though I had nothing to do with it. And isn't this show riddled with tangents anyway, from episode to episode? Yeah, yeah, it's like yeah. basically like how we, we do things here. Well, I'm going a little bit more traditional with my choice of best fantasy movie, and I'm going well for... Drumroll, please, Omega. Okay. The NeverEnding Story. I did love that. Now, why didn't I say that? Tunes. <laughs> These hands are so big. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you should have seen it. Whenever I saw um, Noah and you saw the giant rock monsters, I made uh, Robin burst out laughing by leaning over and you know doing the, the impersonating the rock biter from <laughs> Never Any Story. And the laughter was not well regarded by other people in the cinema. Yeah, well, I, I, did, I did love that movie. But, like, I, I, I saw it when I was really young, and I was kind of, like, traumatized by the idea that uh, it, your mom could die. So I was like, but that, that can't happen. Moms don't die except for in Disney. But then it, like, happened long ago and off screen, except for Bambi, but we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> well, what I love about Neverending Story is, well, it's twofold. It's really, really dark. Bastion. You must give me a name. Artax! Artax! You got that. You got um, Atreus stabbing the fuck out of the wolf. You yeah! Got, I was so scared of that part, that wolf. You've got the sphinxes with the big tits that, you know, laser blast people to death. It's it's really dark. It's the sort of one that, if it was released today, would probably get a PG-13. Yeah, you're right. But because it, it came up before that rating existed, it could get a lower rating. Uh, you got all that. Plus, it's so meta. And not even in the obvious way of, oh, he's reading the book and then the characters are talking to him. And he, it's, it's not just that. The part that I remember is the childlike empress is talking to Atreyu, and, but uh, through talking to Atreyu, she's talking to Bastion, and Bastion's like, oh, she's talking to me. Uh, but then she says... Yeah, when like, the, and the, the shutters fly open in the, the, the crazy haunted attic, oh, and I was like, but, no! Uh, but there's one level beyond that, which is just a single line, which... Uh, but... The childlike empress says that there are other people who have been with Bastion and watching his adventures. I know what you're like. That's me. That was me. Yeah, and that uh, it struck gold and genius for me. Like it's fourth level level of metaness. I think I've I've heard that it was based on a book, but I've never read the book. I want. Uh, it is yes, and um, through the book you can find out what the name of the of the childlike empress he yells at the end is because he does yell it. I always thought he gave the childlike empress his mother's name. Uh, and yes, she did. Sorry, he did. And uh, but they didn't mention the mother's name in any other part of the film. Oh, that's a good point. And if I remember correctly, it's uh, Star Child. Why was his mom called Star Child? I think it was Star Child. It was Star Moon something. Child. Moon Child. That was it. Why was his mom called Moon Child? I don't know. Because she was a for the per- longest time. For the longest time, I just kept on assuming um, her, his mother's name was. I thought he shouted out mom. Find out. That's what I, I didn't find out until, like, I looked it up on Wikipedia, like, what, 10, 15 years after the fact? I'm like, oh, that's what it was. Yeah, I still don't hear it. Yeah, I thought he shouted out Mom. That's what I thought he shouted. Well, anyway. Now you know better. I, I don't remember liking the sequels. I know I saw the second and third, but I remember... The only thing I remember at any of the sequels was the one kid was played by What's-His-Face. Uh, and Jack Black? No, the other kid. Oh, uh, the guy from Sequest. Yeah, yeah. Jonathan, by- blah, 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 who uh, later committed suicide. Yeah. And I just remember there was a part where they're in a boat getting to a city, but the water around it is made of acid, 
Well, and that was called Dante's Peak. That was the really unknown uh, no, Never Not Story that. sequel. No, not that. Not that. You know what I'm talking about. Oh, and also there was a thing that, like, you know, he could sacrifice his memories for something, but I forget what is it. I, it wasn't as good. Yeah, it was crappy. The uh, the first uh, film was apparently the first half of the book, uh, but never read the book. See, I kind of want to. That's one of those ones that I always meant to get to, and then I never did. If you've read it, write the show. I will buy you a copy. Oh, that's nice. Ooh, I have to do it myself. <laughs> Does that mean it's my turn now? Yeah. I think that unequivocally I have to say the Dark Crystal. Dark Crystal is good? Gowfling! Gowfling! What did you think of the, the differences between the usual version and the director's cut that was edited together that we watched? It was very interesting, because I remember, I think we, we had a whole episode on this, didn't we? Uh, yeah, one of the early episodes. Way back in the day. And it's kind of interesting, because you could see a lot of the different stuff that they were originally going for, but in the end, I still do like I still do like the finished product. And uh, in case you audience uh, don't know this or miss that episode or whatever, basically the original version of the Nering story was a lot less mass marketing. Uh, the characters, for the most part, did not speak English. Uh, the char- only the Galflings spoke English. Every- everyone else spoke their own languages, unless they were talking to the Galflings, and the Galflings could understand them. Uh, you had whole sections that were removed and move ar- moved around. Uh, voices, characters were revoiced, and years later, someone took all of the footage they could find from different parts of it and edited it together into a coherent original cut of the Dark Crystal. And it's fascinating. And it's on YouTube, so totally, totally look that up. I mean, I'm pretty sure it still is. Yeah, I don't hey, think. fan edits. Mm. I know, right? This is the kind of world we live in now that you can do shit like that. I've just ordered you a copy of the Neverending Story on book. Did you seriously do that? Yeah. Live on air? Yeah. Oh, I love you. Aww. Thank you. God, I feel like such an idiot. It's just... Because you haven't read either? Favorite... No, it's not that. It's just that we're talking about favorite fantasy movies, and you go with Never Ending Story, Dark Crystal, and here I am, here I am with my thumb up my ass going, Kazam! Well, there well, has to be something else I can think of. I mean, if that was your favorite, you mean, you know. I, I, can um, make, I can make some suggestions, if you'd like. Last Unicorn, uh, you can be just as highbrow as us, or... Uh, oh, alright. You know what? I, I might end up annoying some people with this, as I already have, I'm pretty sure, but favorite fantasy movie, uh, Who Frames Roger Rabbit? That, yeah, that would technically count because it is, it's not really science fiction. And it, it does, it does take place in an, it, I guess what, you know what, that would be urban fantasy. Like it's yeah. very popular, a popular genre now. Yeah. Oh god, I feel like I'm gonna be ranting about that before too long. I, I, actually, I saw that in the theater. That was the first PG-13 movie I saw in the theater. And I saw it because my mom let me sleep over at my friend Becky Zlowski's house. And her older sister Joanna was babysitting for us. And she took us out to see the movies, and she was like, you're allowed to see PG-13 movies, right? And I was like, uh, I don't know, probably. And she's like, all right, that's fine. And I got gummy bears. And then after my mom found out, it was too late. Can't unring a bell. Can't take it back. I already saw it. Wah, wah, wah. It's a, it's a classic film, uh, although part of me is really, really wishing they would do the sequel idea. which there was is a sequel idea? There's been several mooted, and one of them was the, the tunes basically getting... Uh, getting uh, driven out of work by a, a new generation of CGI tunes. It's sort of like... Oh, oh my God, that, that would be, be so awesome. great. Because you could do this whole, like, if you got some rights from Pixar stuff, kind of like what they did with um, uh, uh, the, the video game movie that came out a few years ago. Uh, Ralph? Yeah, that's it. You could do a whole bunch of stuff with that. Yeah. Or I'd like to see a remake done in the style of a book, which was far more gritty and... The tunes were actually, rather than animated, they were basically, if I remember correctly, they were like drawn cartoons, so they can only speak with word bubbles, like they were in comic books. It's a good idea, but I really hope they don't go with it, if for nothing more than the fact that there are so many ways it could be messed up. It would probably be messed up, but it would be interesting. Well, then there's the disappointment of like, oh god, you have something so good there, and you crushed it. Well, the original thing still exists. Because I think you can do a remake without me having it be a reboot, you know? Oh, yeah, the the remake slash sequel that you have every so often. Like, uh, Child's Play 6 is like that. Um, Return to Class of Newcomb High is like that. 
Uh, anyway. I, oh, I've seen far worse come out of Star Trek, though. And to be fair, the the J.J. The Abrams, the first Star Trek movie, is first thing Star Trek related I ever watched. Well, that's your problem. Ooh. <laughs> you, whenever we have guests on, you're always like, I better insult our guests. Make sure they never Where's said that. Where's Patreon page again? I know, right? <laughs> Patreon page again. Exactly. You tell her. Let's see? But, oh, you know what? I I, I thought of another one. Mm-hmm. Uh, Flight of Dragons. It's animated. Does that count? You can do an animated one. I, I've never seen that. Flight of Dragons is amazing. And it's another one that there's a book out there that I haven't read. But it was one of the uh, one of the Bass Rankin animated ones they did with the group that I think almost, yeah, the, the Splinter Group that became Studio Ghibli. Um, they work with Bass Rankin, and they were responsible for The Hobbit and for Return of the King and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So it's in very much in the style of that. And it's got what's his face as the voice of the wizard, and I love him because I loved him in Mash. Uh, he died a few years back. I can't remember his name, but he's really awesome. Check him out. But yeah, Flight of Dragons was great. It would show every so often on the Disney Channel. You'd be like, ah, oh, Flight of Dragons. So if you haven't seen it, it's probably on YouTube somewhere. Go watch it. Flight of Dragons. Uh, no, because it's really cool, and it actually like scientifically explains how. Because the one the main character, I, it's been so long since I've seen it, but the main character was a school teacher who, because of some dimensional portal, got sucked into this magical realm. And he's a man of science. And he, I'm not going to spoil too much about it, but he's like, it's impossible, how can dragons do stuff? And they're like, oh, well, scientifically, this is how dragon fire works. And he's like, oh, that makes a lot of sense, actually. I mean, I'm just saying. Sounds like midichlorians all over again. No, not really. It just It's a very, really good biological way wow, how dragon fire is possible. Oh, there's the cat. She has opinions. Yeah, I don't know if that's if that got picked up on the mic, but I can hear it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can hear it too. Come here. That is uh, the minion cat who sometimes turns up in the flubs in episodes of Hagen, because the house uh, over there they have a white cat and a black cat, so you have Hagen cat and minion cat. Yeah, she comes into my room. She she loves my bed. But if I don't pay attention to her, she'll she'll meep until I go over and pet her. So I petted her, and now she's she's sated. Aww. You know, fantasy movies, especially ones in the eighties, are absolute were genius at making you watch absolute shit based on covers. It was a bit like it was a bit like horror movies, but less watchable, or heavy metal albums. Just the 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 whole thing was you spend one tenth of the budget on making a really kick ass cover, so people will pick it up by you know thinking that'll be interesting. That's a good point. And you got some ones like uh, the Warrior and the Sorceress. Uh, you got Thor the Conqueror. Oh Jesus, Thor the Conqueror! This film. Okay, when I first bought it, I was like eighteen or so. I just saw this really awesome sort of cover thing that could have been a Man of War mo- uh, album cover. I-, I was watching it while I was playing a video game. Even doing that, I only managed to watch something like seventeen minutes of it. And it was then- that bad. Yes. And then I gave it to a friend of mine and basically said, I dare you to do better. And and he said that he, uh, I can't remember how exactly how, how much he saw of it, but he passed it on to someone else, having not finished it himself, and basically made the same challenge. And now, as far as I know, it is going from person to person in Ireland with the dare of do better than the person who watched it before you. So it's like Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants with a really bad DVD. Yes. It's like The Ring, only worse. Yes, although uh, since I started the show, I tracked down, I paid way too much money for it, because my original copy cost me a pound, and the new copy cost me more than that, and it's in my review list. But I have not tried to watch it again, although I'm pretty sure I could handle it now. Well, we'll get drunk, okay, I'll get drunk one night. (laughs) (laughs) See, there was a lot of, like, no-name stuff that I watch, now I can't even remember Although, again, I don't know if this technically counts. It is fantasy, but it's not, you know, sword and sorcery high fantasy. Is uh, The Secret of Nim, the Don Bluth animation based on Miss Brisby and the Rats of Nim, which I watched the fuck out of that when I was little. Every time we rented something from Family Media, what do you want to get? I want to get The Secret of Nim. You got that every time, but I like it the best. I was like that in childhood uh, when it came to a couple of films, like uh, Stay Tuned and... Um uh, time Bandits and uh, yeah, time the Five ban- Doctors. Time Bandits would ca- count as fantasy. Yeah. 
Although when you said high fantasy, I had this idea they should totally do like a Lord of the Rings film starring hippies. No, 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 high fantasy <laughs> like, you know, like Tolkienian fantasy. Yes. Like. I, I, I want to take the ring to, to Mount Doom, but, you know, uh, it's uh, snacks. But it's <laughs> snacks. Actually, actually, Spring. if we ever have a summer that we can do this, we should go up yonder the north coast, you know, where all that, there's all that Giants Causeway and breathtaking scenery, and I think we should film a, a, a fantasy satire, and it could be something like that. Ooh, all ooh, all we need is all we need some camera people and like you know some folks willing to go into hijinks with us. We could do this. I just had an idea. See if you can get in contact with the guys who did Nixon and Hogan Smoke Christmas. Get them to remake Lord of the Rings. They're like in like Perfect. Detroit, aren't they? They're uh, they're in Illinois. They're in somewhere depressing. Um, and Kevin Strange is currently retired from filmmaking. Yeah. But he is right. He, he does he does write books though. He's released like uh, fifteen uh, anthology books. Yeah, but it's not like he can come here to know them. We need to like get together with like people that know actually know what they're what they're doing. And we're like, we have this incredible scenery that's made famous from Game of Thrones. We should totally make a really shitty movie and then put it on YouTube. Who's with us? Yay. I find it really really funny that uh, ten years ago, when you thought of fantasy landscapes, it was New Zealand because of Lord of the Rings, and now it's Northern Ireland. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, we've been oh yeah, because Dragon Age, yeah. Yeah, we've been playing Dragon Age, and I swear, half of the landscapes in the game are Northern Ireland, especially uh, some parts in Ferelden, but and the Storm Coast especially. But it's not just that; like, it's, it's all, almost as though they were like, "We're designing a fantasy world." Let's yeah, there's even the there's even this part, honey. I was playing, I was playing before I started. There's even a part where so you're in Haven, right? And then you need to get the bust of Al Royo, but you actually have to go all the way up to Tevinter first, and then back. Oh, ah, didn't have to do that. I was making fun of the bus system here in Oh, I apologize. I, I, I got lost. My joke failed. But yeah, yeah. Um, I just think it's funny that the landscape I, I look at every single day is now suddenly... This well, is fantasy let's and Let's go amazing. back to that for a second. Why would you expect that you'd have to get a bus I don't in know. Dragon Age? It's a dragon bus. <laughs> I've just, Ugh. I just had to go back and examine that for a second, but please do continue. Could, could just be a figure of speech. You weren't, no, you weren't paying attention is what you were doing. You were doing that thing where you were waiting for me to stop talking so you could say something. No, I was listening. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Ah, yes, apparently I live in a fantasy land now. It's rather funny. Mm. Just because we have a really green and really brown and really wet and really craggy, rocky landscape, it's suddenly the sort of thing where dragons live. Hey, you never know. <laughs> I think Dragon Age 2, I felt homesick. And and the fucking Giant's Causeway is t- half an hour away. Right. But, do you know what time it is? Uh, time we talked about Krull? No, it's not time we talked about Krull. So here's the thing. So we don't have any episodes of Doctor Who to talk about because, well, they're kind of it until Christmas and I'm not going to get her wound up about Christmas just right now. So we're going to bring our little lobster friend here in the middle. Because we're also conducting a very important experiment, which I'll tell you about next episode if it ends up panning out. It is now time for that part of the show that we could get rid of, even though we tried. It's time for Giovanni's trivia question. And Giovanni, are you with us today? Yeah, boss, here I am. Uh, so I want to extend a uh, warm welcome to Mahan the Creeper Wolf, or Wolf Creeper, or Cre- Wolf Creek. But anyway, so I, I hear you're from down under, and that's cool because I have some lobster friends down there. You see, the water's real nice and stuff, so uh, welcome. Welcome to, to, our, to our humble podcast. Oh, thank you. And good thing you came here. I was just getting the uh, pot of boiling water ready. That's never been funny. It's, it's no lobster funny. on the Barbie. It's not funny when she does it. It's not funny when you do it. It's not funny when people do it on Twitter. It's not funny. Because if you do this, I'm already red. Capiche? Okay, so anyway. Does like Capiche say carapace? <laughs> yeah, that, that actually is pretty funny. I think I might do that in, in, in a, a next time. But so our last trivia question was just getting the infamous Max Headroom incident. When the Max Headroom lookalike or imposter pirated the signal and interrupted television programs. Two television programs is in 1987. And what two television programs were they? Well, our good friend Dirk Cork, the German who knows everything, knew that it was in fact a 9 o'clock news. And later on a different channel, it was Doctor Who. And, uh, Hagen, which episode of Doctor Who was it? 
I don't know the exact episode, but it was Horror of Fang Rock, the four-parter. That's close enough. But I do want to say honorable mention that is Danny Amigurami on Twitter, who got it a few minutes after Dirk Cork. So, ah, Aragurami, it means difficult to pronounce. It does. But you get an honorable mention just for being like right next to Dirk Cork. But so anyway, today's trivia question is, now, uh, Michael Jackson, God rest his soul and all that stuff, did write a book, okay, kind of wrote a book back in the day. And it was edited by someone you would never expect to have edited a book. Who was it? Who edited Michael Jackson's book? I think it was biography, was it not? Autobiography, 1988, called Moonwalk. Who was it? <laughs> You're never going to guess if you don't already know. But or if you don't check. And don't Google. That's cheating. So the way this works is, as soon as, as this goes on blip, tweet at the Omega Geek. That is at the Omega Geek on Twitter. If you are first, you'll be my favorite mammal for this week. So anyway, that's been me. Goodbye, my adoring radio public. I'm pretty sure uh, Neil Gaiman, early in his career, he he wrote a book either with or for or about, uh, like Duran Duran or something. Really? I think so, yeah. That's kind of interesting. But uh, second half of the show, we're going to talk about uh, more about the more modern ones, but because there's lots we didn't talk about in the first one. <coughs> here's <coughs> what we're going to do, and here's what we're going to do, and here's us totally not doing it. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk mostly about the newer ones, but we can talk about old ones if you want, because Lady Hawk, Labyrinth, you know. I didn't like Labyrinth as much as Dark Crystal, mostly because I wanted to slap that girl. I mean, seriously. Aww. I didn't like her. She was a whiny bitch. Me, 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 me. And I'm supposed to empathize with her? It's her own fault her brother got taken, and she needs to get her head... Wait, Beaker was in that movie? Who? Beaker from The Muppets. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> yes, yes, he was. It's Jim Henson production. He was, uh, he was an extra. But yeah, oh, she was, okay, nice save there. She was such a bitch. Like, I was like, shut up. No one cares about your life. Jesus Christ, get over it. You know? And it's just, I don't know. Although I do like that I, I saw a fan interpretation, I think a year ago, online, that, that someone sat down and examined this and, and said, you know, made created this whole fan canon where... He, the Goblin King, had a girl named Sarah eons, eons ago, and he keeps he keeps kidnapping Sarahs. Yeah, and the and their little brothers, and uh, whenever a Sarah doesn't manage to rescue little brother, they become a goblin. Mm-hmm. It's a really good fan. Although I gotta say, I love David Bowie and everything he does. I just want to get on the record and say that I prefer Labyrinth over Dark Crystal. So any marauding bands of Labyrinth fans, you know, aim at Omega, not me. What? No, how could you even deal with her? She's like, what's her face from Twilight, but like a few decades early. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. That's I'm unfair. Calling Paul Cr- yeah, I, that is seriously she, unfair. No, because... At least Jennifer Connelly can carry a bit of drama. Uh, well, very a- actress aside, actress aside, because I'm not like comparing this girl to Kristen Stewart, but the character is just so one-sided. Like, you know, first she's like, oh, things and stuff, and I'm so You selfish. don't Thank think me. you bad. Uh, but then, and then she's like, oh, shit, really fucked this up, didn't I? Oh, now my driving goal is to find my brother, which is admirable, I guess, but still, it was your own fault, babe. Just saying. If you think, if you think I'm cruel at the show. Are you going to insult Kroll as well? No. You can almost hear the fan hate coming in. People can, I, I, I'm entitled, it's a free country, I'm entitled to my opinion. I'm not hey, saying. Hey, I'm, not saying that, I'm not saying that it's a bad movie. I'm saying I didn't like this character. I really like the special effects. Everything Jim Henson touches is gold. It turns to gold. I mean, I I love what his his, his creature shop did, and I love David Bowie. But I, you know, I mean, I'm not like I'll never watch it. I'm just saying that I like Dark Crystal better, and I don't like that girl. The lady does protest too much. I can protest as much as I want. It's my show. <laughs> I like them apples. <laughs> but all right, you can talk about Cole now. Crow is brilliantly terrible, and features a very young Liam Neeson and Robbie Coltrane. Now that I didn't know. Mm-hmm. They're playing like warriors. Yo, you know what I haven't thought about in a dog's age? Willow. Willow's great with the Eber Sisk and uh, Val Kilmer. I actually need to uh, ask Creature to do some Photoshop with me uh, involving the Daikini from that. For Although. The line that I'll never forget, only because the, the little kid who was with me um, in daycare, we, we watched this in daycare, on, and because it was one of those rainy days, and the woman who, I probably shouldn't be saying this, but the woman who ran the daycare checked her numbers on state inspection day, so she had way more kids than she should have. She was crooked. 
But so she's like, all right, we're going, we're going to the movies, everybody. We're going to the movie. We went to see Willow. <laughs> and there's this one line that one of the, the, the little pixie guys has. I remember you. We still baby. Why are you taking a PV? And this child repeated that line for the next three months. Like, no matter <laughs> what happened in daycare, I was like, you little fucker, you need to shut up. Kids say the darndest thing. I'm going to stop right there, I think. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, Willow was good. What's his face? Gentlemen, meet Lug. Or, you are great. <laughs> I, I I love Willow. I wish it had had its sequels. Was like it Lucas, supposed to have sequels? Yeah, Lucas wanted to do a whole, like, you know, Star Wars of fantasy with it, but it didn't make the money. Mm. I think that's what a lot of fans... And, you know, I, I think Nash has made this point on Here There Be Dragons, that they were so looking for the Star Wars fantasy in the 80s, and it just never really seemed to happen. Yeah, although uh, there's some sequels to all of done in book form. Well, books are always good. She said, bookshoppishly. <laughs> what do you think of um, Adventures of Baron Munchausen? You know, I have never seen the live-action one. I saw an animated one years and years and years and years ago. But I've okay, never well, actually seen the live-action one. I'm going to show you it at some point. I know that like some of the Monty Python guys are in it. Um... Eric Idle, and, but Terry Gilliam uh, sort of directed it. But I had this wonderful... Okay, you know in uh, Two Towers when you got Saruman yelling at his like army of orcs and then you have the camera pans back past all of these thousands of CGI orcs and it's really impressive? Mm-hmm. Well, there's a shot like that in Baron Munchausen. And, but it's all done practical with, full sta- with full-size uh, models. At, like one-to-one size of models with, like, siege towers and cannons and army guys, all, like, about a mile and a half, just pans back. And you can see why Baron Munchausen was one of the most colossal financial failures of all time. It was the most expensive film ever made. It bankrupted, I think, one and a half Even, like, by by our standards now? Uh, For, if you put adjustment for um, inflation in, probably. Okay. It, uh, It bankrupted at least one studio. It was worked across the, it like, used almost all of the film people, filmmaking apparatus in like two continents, possibly three. I can't remember the exact details. This was a massive production. Wow. And I, and I really wish Gilliam had been in charge of Lord of the Rings simply because I knew he would have gone to the effort of genetically engineering his own master race of orcs just for that shot. <laughs> but then if that happened, Lord of the Rings, no matter how many people went to go see it, would still go over budget, which is a really bad trend when it comes to Gilliam films. Yeah, but Gilliam's amazing. That's why it's like, I don't care. Gilliam, you don't need to make money. You're just awesome. It's very admirable. I'll give him that. Yep. And he's still trying to make uh, The Man Who Killed Don Quixote. I've uh, not heard anything about this. Okay, 1989, he raised a bunch of money in Europe. This was like one of the largest uh, productions in various European countries. He raised all this money, got Johnny Depp over. He cast this aged and venerable Spanish actor who played Don Quixote. Johnny Depp was playing Sancho Panza, this modern-day guy who was sent back in time, and, and he was he assumed the role of Sancho Panza. And he, he filmed several days. Rather, he, he worked on this for years to try and get it made. And then he, after he filmed... Okay, first day of filming, they discovered that the place they were filming was right underneath a Spanish military base. Or like an aircraft base, so there were planes constantly going over. So some shots were unusable. They, they would have had to redub everything. It's like that's annoying, bad, annoying. But then the whole, all the sets were like you know destroyed in flash floods. And Jesus. then the lead actor uh, came down with severe uh, um, medical issues that later killed him, mm-hmm. and the film collapsed. And the, the rights to the film, to the idea of the unique idea of how to handle Don Quixote in this way, mm-hmm. it was tied up in rights issues and uh, insurance issues and stuff for 10 years. And it's only now that Gilliam's getting back to attempting to remount it. But now apparently it's all set in the modern day because he had to cut his budget and everything. Oh. They, they made a... Fun, the, these guys made a fantastic documentary about it because these guys were there to make a documentary about the making of the film for the DVD. And instead, they made a documentary about how a film collapses and it's called uh, Lost in La Mancha. Oh. Oh, but you know what? You know what I was thinking of while you were saying that? Legend. Mm-hmm. Oh, God. Do you yeah. know? I didn't see Legend until I was in my 20s. Hmm. And I will tell you the story. This We were having a girls' night at um, this friend of mine's house. So it was a whole bunch of us. And we'd already been drinking, like, most of the night. And my friend, a friend of mine brought up Legend. I was like, what? I've never seen that movie. She's like, what? A travesty. I have it on DVD. Let's watch it now. So uh, my one friend, the bartender, was making us all drinks. 
And so she made us all really huge white Russians, like huge white Russians in a Pilsner glass, like in a pint glass. That's how big it was. And so I didn't want to sit on the couch drinking like this drink that might, you know, I might spill. And I'm always thirsty because I'm always talking. So I didn't really understand the power of alcohol back then. I do now. And so I drank it really quick so, you know, I could watch the movie. And my friend said, you didn't so much as sit down on the ground as if you were suddenly on the floor. I was like, I passed out. And she's like, no, you were just suddenly Indian style in like one ninja move. The only thing I remember about, I was so drunk, the only thing I remember about that movie was there's a little kid who says, I am Gump of the Woods. And apparently it's like, you got you guys, it's Forrest Gump. Get it? Get it? It's, it's for Forrest. It's for Forrest Gump. Get it? Like for 20 minutes. And that's how it's uh, I was drunk. <laughs> I was so I, that was one of the few times in my life I've been hungover. And I blame I blame Tim Curry's horns. Amen. Tim Curry was amazing. I would love to see a film version of uh, of gargoyles with the characters created using the Tim Curry type makeup. Uh, it, they'd have to work really hard on it, or it look would look cheesy. It's gonna be cheesy regardless, though. Yeah, I don't know. I just. It would have to look really, really good to not look bad, is what I'm saying. Well, like, yeah. you know how the original Ninja Turtles movie, it looked really good. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, this recent one, they tried really hard and paid a lot of money for it to look kind of bad, just saying. Well, that's because they're CGI ones. So, if you're going to make a comparison, you know, when talking about practical special effects, because I'm not talking about CGI in the Gargoyles, I'm saying it should be practical like in Legend. Yeah, but still, I have the feeling that, you know, I don't know, it might turn out bad. Just saying. But, Mahan, do you have any other noteworthy fantasy films you want to talk about? Uh, I do have one in mind, but I kind of get the people that I'm... kind of get the feeling that I will piss some people off by even considering it a fantasy movie. Again? No, I mean seriously this time. But, you know what? Screw it. Favorite musical? Fantasy? South Park. Huh. No, I do have to go with you. That is one of my favorite musicals ever. <laughs> Just yeah, it's all well. It kinds it of does awesome. it does have an epic battle between good and evil. I, I yeah I, I can see it. All right, I'll I'll go with you on that one. Oh my god, we we had to go see it, and we had no idea it was a musical. We thought it'd just be a really long episode, and we were so blown away. We came back the next night and saw it again. I had I bought this I bought the soundtrack the next day. I was like, this is so magical, and I told my parents because my parents, you wouldn't think, but they really did end up enjoying, like, the first few episodes of South Park. And I was like, Mom, you have to see this. It's hilarious. And they, then I let them listen to the soundtrack, and they thought it was amazing. Aww. And, and I just, that, that moment, that, 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 that moment when you, he, he starts to break out into Kyle's mom's a big fat bitch, and you're like, yeah, oh my gosh, he's going to break out in a song, and then he doesn't. And you're like, oh, okay, I guess they were just teasing us. And then he does, he's like, yes, he's going to sing Kyle's mom's a big fat bitch. Like, you know, on the big screen, this is the best moment of my life. <laughs> Shut up. In all honesty, I'm more of a guy for modern cinema. It's like, I, I've seen pretty much everything that's come out in the last couple of years, but you, you asked me, like, ten years back, I'm like, uh-huh, what? So, I'm, I know I'm clutching at straws. You're not bit, clutching so. at straws. She's just seen every movie ever. Welcome to my life, pretty Polar much. Bear King, have you seen that? No. It's got, a, it's got a guy who gets turned into a polar bear, and he's... He's got to find love with a human woman. Isn't that just like the boy version of the Swan Princess? Possibly. Sounds like a shit uh, version of, um, what is it, the Golden Compass? Yeah, but that had a whole mythology and stuff, and apparently the books are fucking amazing and the movie was bad. Mm. I haven't read them, but that's what I'm told. Also, what's it, like? basically the whole entire point is that there's no God. Like, they asked him about this, Philip Pullman. They're like, so people have been saying that these books are about how there's no God. Is that true? And he's like, yeah, that's exactly what I intended them to be. They're parables about how there's no God. Which is interesting, because in the Golden Compass universe, there is a God. He's just shit. Yeah, but it's like there's an atheistic tone to it, because Pullman is an atheist. And because uh, Pullman really hated uh, C.S. Lewis's sort of, you know, sticking Christianity into everything. So he wanted to do an opposite version. Pretty much. You know, I always got in a fight with a co-worker of mine, you know, because I was like, oh, so I went and saw um, the Chronicles of Narnia this last weekend. It was really great. And she was she was her own person right there. She's like, don't you tell me about that. Don't you tell me about that Harry Potter witchcraft. I don't want to hear about that. I'm a good, good Christian. And I was like, Sandy, Sandy, use Google. 
And she's like, what? I'm like, C.S. Lewis was a Christian. He was a Christian writer. Most of the stuff he wrote is Christian nonfiction about how to be a better Christian and interpret, like, biblical stuff. She's like, really? I'm like, yeah. As on the line is a Christ figure. And I had to Google the wiki for Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And I was like, look, see? It's all about Jesus. And she's like, oh, well, I think I'll, I want to see if, if some of the ladies in my church want to go with me. I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, her God. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I do like the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, though, because I had this really great um, animated version that we taped off um, We taped off Disney Channel when I was little, which I've since come to find out from knowing you that that was a U.K. Uh, production. Yeah, the, the one with the crappy animation. Yeah, but I loved it. I don't care. Oh, yeah, I've seen that one. I had I had that one back on v- VHS way back when. And it's kind of weird because now I've seen, what is it, three or four adaptations of Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It's weird. And even though it's crappy, it's still the best. Although, when I was a little kid, I was very literal, so they were like, are you a son of Adam and daughter of Eve? And I was like, I said to my parents, like, I don't understand, because Adam and Eve are their parents. So you are a son of Adam and a son of Eve because she is your mom. Mom's like, just, just never mind, just, just go with it. Yeah, I was, I was equally confused by that when I was a kid. And again, it's kind of like the uh, old Moonchild thing. It wasn't until I looked it up and I'm like, oh, and then facepalm because I didn't realize it earlier. Yeah, like Aslan calls the one of like the little evil creatures a son of Earth. So does that mean he's an animal? Like because the the beavers and the the satyrs and stuff, like are they? They don't. I guess they don't have immortal souls because they're animals. It's just somebody like I, citation needed. Or maybe it's some sort of like someone taking Mother Nature way too literally. I figure that the Earth literally gave birth to these creatures. Well, they meet Santa Claus. There's a part well, where they do. It's not really any, kind of really weird. It's not really any more silly than Aslan thinking that Eve literally gave birth to Susan. I am Aslan. I am not that bright. As, okay, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe films really annoyed me because they replaced the voice of Brian Cox with Liam Neeson for Aslan. Because I got no issue with Liam Neeson in particular, but he has one performance, and that is, I am Liam Neeson, sometimes I'm more Northern Irish than other times. And it's like Brian Cox at least can do different performances. I'm sorry. Sorry you feel that way. Plus, I have a tendency to get into rants about C.S. Lewis and how he is a... Not a brilliant um, apologist. I've only really read... Um, I read No, I read two of his books. I read The Magician's Apprentice, which is actually the prequel to Lion, Within the Wardrobe. And I read that one. I never read the rest of them. So I read that. Although, a really funny thing is that there is a C.S. Lewis book. And it's one of his nonfiction books. But I, and I forget what the title is. If someone can Google this and look it up, write the show. But this was published many years ago. Like, a long time ago. Long before Twilight. But... It's, I think it's about, like, humility and stuff like that. The cover is mostly dark, with a child's hands holding an apple, which really, really, really resembled the original cover of the first Twilight book. <laughs> and I thought that was really funny. Plagiarism! Plagiarism! C.S. Lewis ripped it off, says so many straw women, it's really embarrassing. Oh, Twilight. Oh, Modern-day fantasy classic, Suburban Nights. Um, no. I mean, I like everybody, I'm raging, but no. I'm a raging fanboy, but even I'm not going to stick my nose out for that it, too much. What's wrong with Suburban Nights? It's not as good as Kikassia, but it's nothing wrong with it. No, there's something wrong with it. It's just, it's... It's got the not... same issues as Kikassia. I know that Doug writes everyone as Doug, but that's its main issue. Everything else is just like, eh... This I wouldn't call like, it. I wouldn't call it a fantasy classic. Is all I'm saying. I mean, good those, job, everybody. Watch it once and leave alone for the rest of your life, and that's pretty much it. I'm I, just... I, I watched it that one time. Did you? Yes, because you were like, "Why haven't you watched this?" And I was like, "I don't know." She's like, "You know some of the people in it." And I'm like, "They won't take it personally. They're not going to like quiz me." She's like, "We should watch it," and I was like, "Oh, fine." Oh, okay. Well, I am stroking my copy of oh, *Suburban Nights* I have on DVD. Stop stroking. No one... Okay, you need to know, honey, that... I know that when you say stroke, you mean pet, like one would pet a cat. But in American English, that, like, stroking is, like, has a sexual connotation. So I just want to let you know about that. Stroking! Stop it! Oh, suburban knights, I'll protect you. But anyway, I have a copy. I do, I do, I have, I, I bought a copy of all three of the movies. Uh, and I did after, right after Justin died, because I was like, well... 
You didn't ask me to sign your copy of uh, The Worldly Flea. Because I have a tiny gonna, bit in it. We're not going to talk about that because I want everyone to know, okay, it's nowhere in the credits, but I'm going to tell you all what. Okay, her cameo in To Boldly Flea, I had to crouch on no, the No, no, sta- no, no, that was the Uncanny Valley. Huh? Well, To Boldly Flea, I found oh. it over in Derry. Too bad. Well, I'm going to talk about this because I'm angry. Because, all right, for Uncanny Valley, I had to crouch on the basement stairs for three and a half hours holding this camera... Like, because it was on uneven stairs, so it, the camera would not move, and I missed most of RDA that night, and I, and I, and my legs were hurting and everything like that, so you guys better go watch it, because, and appreciate the fuck out of it, because I'm just saying. Even though the bit that, the bit at the end where, where I turn up, well, we turn up, uh, it was probably the weakest part of the film. I don't care. <laughs> it's had, not our fault, though. Had to it's, crouch in the stairs. It's just over long for what it should be. Well, just saying. Name a film, Mahan. Um... Uh, you know what? I actually kind of like Twilight. I'll be honest. It's friggin' hilarious. I've it's, only seen the second movie. It's honestly a lot more fun than some of the other fantasy movies out there that take themselves a little too seriously, but at least when Twilight does it, it's funny. Although I will I will say one good thing about Twilight. They did have really good werewolf CGI. And that's, which that's made my... Them look like, which made them look like wergs for some reason. I don't care. It looked better than, like, in other ones where they look like bat demons. I'm looking at you, Underworld. But no, like, we saw the second movie, because we were, a whole bunch of us booksellers went to see if we could deliberately get kicked out. It was interesting. But, so, that's how I would describe the second movie. Five minutes of the best werewolf CGI I've ever seen, wrapped up in a feminine feminine hygiene commercial. I also find it hilarious that, um, for the longest time, me and a couple other guys I was talk- I talked with Twilight about, occasionally, were always like, oh, God... Kristen Stewart's such a bad actor. And then in the final movie, she actually tries to act, and it's worse. <laughs> so much for wishing for the better. Oh, I take it back. There was a really good scene where she's, like, in her room being depressed, and it's one continuous shot with a camera, like, like she's stationary, and the camera's rotating around her, and each time you go by the window, it's a different season. And it was really well done. I was like, ah, it's a really good camera shot. That's a really great, you know, cinematography kind of thing. And then my friend leaned over and she goes, does that mean that she hasn't changed her clothes in like six months? And we were like, oh, I guess it does. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but now we're in third wave young adult adaptations thanks to the Hunger Games. And we're moving away from paranormal romances. I, I have no- Whatever gods you have. I have not seen any of the Hunger Games movies. I briefly considered try- dragging Omega over to see a special showing of the first three. But it would uh, have been like 21 pounds for each of us, and it, yeah. I had an, an exam the next day, so... Yeah, so we decided not to. But, well, plus you pointed out, we're probably going to do a marathon at some point with all four when they're out. Well, I want to read the books, because the books actually are well-written. So let me read the books, then we'll see the movies, so I can whine about how the books are better. Although you know that in about a year, you're going to have to go to see The Maze Runner 2. <laughs> no, it's, it's The Scorch Trials is the second one. They'll probably call it something like The Maze Runner, you know, and then hyphen The Scorch Trials or something. Yeah, it's yeah, just... Yeah, same thing to do with Catching Fire. Yeah. Well, it's just, I mean, we, and there's a, we have a backseat critique of, of ours up, so go look it up if you haven't seen it. But it was a really good movie until the last five minutes. And you were like, oh, that's not a really good explanation for all of this. Yeah, Maze Runner is just like, there is no possible way that this can make any fucking sense. And it doesn't. But the effects were good. Effects were fine. It was, you know, it was just like, hello, cube crossed with Temple Run. Like, if this had been in the Dark City vein of things, I mean, again, we're not going to give out spoilers, that would have been really great. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, that was really really awesome, yeah. Have you ever seen uh, Stardust? Yes, yes I did, and I really liked it, and I liked that there was a gay part that really made it for me. Stardust is uh, the closest thing I've ever seen to a modern version of The Princess Bride. Mm. Oh yeah, it did take, didn't it take place in like the the early Victorian era? It was like 1840 something? Uh, something like that. But I um, was kind of depressed that it didn't do better than it did. Yeah, but it was still, it was, but... A lot of films don't do very well on initial release and then get their reputations. Princess Bride was like that as well. That's a good point. And I just quoted that just today to my sister-in-law. Just saying. Princess Bride? Yeah. Because she sat down to play Assassin's Creed, and I was going to go upstairs and play Dragon Age. And I said, well, 
I'm going to go save Thetis. Have fun storming the Bastille. <laughs> and then she says the same thing that she always says when I say that. I already did that at the beginning of the game. And I said, oh, yeah, that's right. So there you go. But that has been us for this week, or episode 79. And we want to extend our thanks to Mahan, the wolf creeper, the creaker of wolves. Where can we find you, should we want to, in the world? Um, I have a regular review blog, Mahan's Media, which is at betwixtstarproductions.blogspot, where I essentially review any new movie that I see. I end up making writing, like, what is it? Anywhere from two to five reviews a week. And that's, and that's if I'm not feeling all that proactive. So I'll always be writing new stuff. In fact, I think my latest review will be on Love Is Now. Oh, God. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to <laughs> raging, venting my spleen on that little piece of work. <laughs> you do yourself a favor and watch both of the Lou Ferrigno Hercules movies from the 70s. Lou no Ferrigno. I think you would have a lot to say about them. Oh, <laughs> uh, dear. But anyway, that has been us for this week. I hope the Omega and Honey, who do you have want to have been this week? Red Sonia. Very adequate choice. Yeah. <laughs> See y'all later. <laughs>